I mean, I just thought it was very interesting. He raised his hand and went to start a DG. He didn't have a DG name. And the following day, he asked his guys at work if they can start one, and they are all in. So it's Workplace DG. Workplace DG, workplace come DG. on. That is what so that was a step it. of obedience. He raised up his hand, said, I want to lead a discipleship group. Yeah. And now Kalax is leading a group. We're so, so excited. Kalax, if you're here and if your group is watching, shout out to you. Well done. Oh. Well done. I love that. Yeah. Other, other highlights or maybe things you've seen? Yeah. What, what was that? Yeah. I, I think for me, uh, one, of, one of the highlights was, the, you know, there's a place where you talked about um, how anointing is transmitted it's not mm. taught mm. it's caught it's not taught and i remember uh, i i caught the anointing wow <laughs> especially oh. the apostolic anointing and i remember i, I think i had shared earlier on that um uh, uh, earlier this week earlier this week um there's a there's a place we've been trusting god to do ministry uh, a specific uh, neighborhood near where we stay and so this place, the management of the estate reached out and they, they asked for us to go and start mentoring their young people. Wow. They are teenagers, they are children. We had proposed Mizizi before, but they hadn't taken it so, you know, joyfully or it, with any excitement. But now they were the ones reaching out and they said, could you come with a team to come and mentor our young people? And the only explanation I could give there is just the anointing for apostolic mm -hmm. ministry. Mm -hmm. Because it's a new place, it has many people, but we hadn't gotten a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so that's the anointing. So after the right. gathering, that's what happened. Yeah. Yeah. And all these secular people are calling you to now disciple mm -hmm. yes. the, the, the neighborhood. The entire neighborhood. Basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Praise God. What a God. Yeah. What an anointing. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Pastor, yeah. Pastor Mills, you're going to say. Yeah. Um, oh, we've, we've had so many testimonies during our prayer time. Um, because we've been praying through uh, the gathering since Monday, and uh, some of the testimonies that uh, we've gotten, and even some people have called uh, to just share, is someone said they received a Papa Jimmy anointing. <laughs> anointing for prayer, anointing for prophecy, anointing to see spiritual things. Wow. And this person said they spoke to a colleague at their workplace who, was, who had not shared to them uh, what they were going through but because they had seen themselves now for the first time as a prayer supplier, they went to supply prayer to this person. And when they were talking to them, this person starts crying, wondering, how did you know these things wow. about me? And then this lady was like, what? Um, me have gotten a Papa Jimmy anointing. <laughs> uh, uh, and then another one, uh, uh, at her workplace, she's supposed to be organizing training. This time she just decided... I have a Papa Kilo anointing of teaching. Can, See, we were given impartation. I can teach myself. I can teach. Yeah. So they went, wow. took the, some of the notes from what has been taught before and taught. And taught, guys taught were, at Mavuno? At, no, at their workplace. Or same notes that had been taught Same at notes that had been taught yeah. at Mavuno. They went wow. and taught them at their workplace and guys were leaning in, wondering, hey, Yanni, you, you are just hiding your great gift here, uh, bringing people to teach us from outside. Yeah, so I think for me, that that, yeah, that just yeah. says God just allowed many people to to receive to uh, different uh, impartation. I remember there was a lady from Mavuno Rongai. Uh, she received the anointing of healing that was so crazy. In fact, it numbed her on one side. Wow. Yes, it was so powerful that it numbed her on one side. So we ju just had to pray for her and ask her to find someone who's unwell and just pray for them for the thing to <laughs> the heaviness to go away wow hey rahema said i received healing i had a feeling similar to lightning strike me and something was pulled out from me wow. and that's rahema's uh testimony oh my goodness that's awesome praise god rahema that's an amazing testimony uh Say somebody, Michael says, I wasn't there physically, Michael Jeru, but I followed online. My highlight was a teaching on how you can lose your anointing. Uh, Lynette Machina says, I desire the Papa Jimmy anointing of prayer and fasting. Come on. Come on. You've got to desire it. Yeah. And you will receive it, yeah. isn't it? Uh, I think the gathering taught you how to desire that anointing. Uh, so I love it. I love it. I love it. If you, if you want to do great things, first acknowledge that you don't know it all. And that's oh. Trina who said that. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Um, this is so awesome. This is just people's highlights. Um, 
Uh, Edwin says, snippets of new music by Mavuno Worship was also a highlight, which I really love. Do you know there's someone who said your dance? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Pastor M danced. Actually, yeah. Oh my Pastor gosh. Irene. That needs to be deleted from <laughs> Institute <laughs> and Sam on stage. <laughs> yeah, that was anointing. By the way, <laughs> we are composing songs on stage. That was so much, so much fun. I love it. Um, and this somebody else says, Kangai Faith says, my highlight was the anointing I received, something I've never felt, and I was able to know my anointing. So I love, wow. I love that. Yeah. So, wow. Uh, yep. Probably for me, it's just uh, another testimony that, that I'd like to share. Not from this gathering, but, but from the November one. Okay. The testimony was shared huh. in service this week. The lady was sharing with us in church how she has been sick for many, many years. I think she, she mentioned since class four. And her mother had been taking her to hospital after hospital, specialist after specialist, medicine and uh, after medicine. So when she got to uh, university where she currently is, she got extremely, extremely ill and down. Wow. She was taken to this uh, specialist where uh, she was referred to, got loads of uh, medicines, but then that weekend happened to be the gathering. So from her testimony, she said the guy who prayed for her had beards and specs. So I suspect it must be either I've only seen Pastor Irosh and Mugambi with beards and spe beards specs. So I, sp I, I suspected Pastor it was... Pastor Milton also has beards and specs. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. No, but it was not Pastor Milton because he knows... <laughs> okay. in, she All knows right. Pastor Milton. <laughs> so I suspected it was either Pastor Mugambi or Irosh who prayed for... Who prayed for her because of the... Okay, what they're not yeah. called beards. How are they go called? The, the yeah. The, those yeah. Those. So <laughs> she said after, after those prayers, after those... Prayers immediately, what she was suffering from ceased since November last year to date. Wow. It has never recurred again. Wow. And she's been suffering from it since she was in class four all the way to now that she's in campus. Wow. So I felt that was a really, really amazing testimony. After wow. that prayer, she got totally I healed. love it. There was healing in the house. A car Suma says, I received healing and the gift of healing at the same time. Wow. I prayed for my daughter, I guess after this, who had two, a two-week homer or cold. I prayed and it disappeared in two hours wow. after two weeks of illness. Wow. Guys, I mean, these are powerful testimonies. Wow. These are such amazing testimonies of what God did in just a short time of being there, waiting on him. There's something powerful when the family comes together physically yeah. and just spends time together, yeah. listening to God's word. I really believe that God's word has just a way of freeing. You know, I love that at the very beginning, Pastor Milton prophesied and said, in this gathering, people won't even come up for, pr for healing. Mm. So we didn't actually pray for people f like touching people or God was just healing people in the middle of the gathering. And that was incredible. I just found that so amazing. So wow, thank you guys. It's fun doing ministry with you. It's really a lot of fun. And it was fun to have every one of you. I think that we had like over a thousand people. That's like the best attended gathering we've ever had. Like over a thousand people showed up at Hill City Friday, Saturday. And boy, what an amazing time. So incredible. Incredible, incredible. What a gathering. Yeah. And you know, it, it connects a lot with the conversation that we're having right now. Yeah. Uh, because I feel like the, the series hanging by a thread. Uh, it really, I think this last week's message was very connected yeah. with, with what we're talking about at the, at the gathering. Because yeah. we've been going through this series, hanging by a thread. Uh, what do you do when you get to the end of your rope? Yeah. And in a sense, it's like God teaching us about those situations in our lives, those end of the you know you get to the end of yourself situations mm. i do, by the way reading this even i've been amazed at how many problems I, I, this guy called elijah elisha uh helped solve mm. so many came, people came to him at the end of their rope mm. and we've been looking at each one of them at one after the other just to see the challenges they faced and this week was a very interesting one it's a prophet who lost his axe mm. yeah. it's it's a it's a it's a dude who uh was the cutting wood to build a new ministry center. He was actually uh, there with Elisha. They had invited Elisha to help them to do this. Elisha was a new prophet at that point. He just received the mantle from Elijah. hadn't been a long time. Uh, so he came and he was helping the prophets to build this place. Then the axe head gets falls. It's a, it's a story I remember reading as a child, but I don't think I ever really paid it attention. And then when the axe head falls in the water, he cries out and asks Elisha for help, uh, calls out, and Elisha throws a piece of wood on the water and the thing floats. And Elisha tells him, pick it up. Mm. It was such a powerful message. I mean, just the way the, the Lord brought this word out as we taught it. Mm. 
there's some really exciting things that I feel like it taught us. But I guess the question was asking us is, what do you do when you lose your edge? Uh, so this guy lost an axe. He lost the sharp edge. And he lost it because of various reasons. He probably didn't realize he was losing it. It was getting loose as he was working on this axe. Slowly it was dislodging. He didn't realize. And eventually the thing went. And panic on him because it was the most valuable thing. He could not afford to replace it. It was borrowed. It didn't come from him. And now it had, it was, it had gone missing. And he called out for help. And then the thing was actually, it floated. So there were some incredible lessons. I, I guess some of you guys were teaching this. Uh, but I guess one of the things that we talked about is the fact that God cares about the little details in our lives. Yeah. It was a huge detail for this guy, actually, because it was like a thing to do with his economic prosperity. But even God cares about the things we've lost, yeah. even, if, even the ones we didn't mean to lose. And I love the metaphorical uh, understanding of it. It's not just the physical things. It's even the things of faith. Because there are times you lose that passion you had for God. Yeah. There are times you, 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 had, you psyched. When you compare yourself now with where you are back in the day, you're not who you used to be. You had love for missions. You had love for God. You had love for people. You had love for ministry. But somehow along the road, it just started loosening. Yeah. Without you knowing it's about to loosen. Yeah. And one day, it's just like whoosh, the thing flew off. It had been flying off for a while. You just didn't realize. And then it was gone. Yeah. And you lost it. And this was just really pulling us back to, hey, what have you lost? Uh, what are those things you've lost that you shouldn't have lost? And now you find that you've lost them. So let me just hear what you guys pulled out of that time because it was such an amazing, amazing uh, message. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess for me, one of the things that <coughs> really stood out is the first response that this uh, prophet had is to cry out to prophet Elisha. Mm. And his response was not, you know, it was not logical. It was not, it was not those responses that we have. You know, sometimes in in our um, in our um, in our human nature, our first response is usually the logical, most appropriate response, most the response that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Let me go. Let me find where it was, and then let me call people to come and help if need be. But in most cases, you'd actually f troubleshoot by yourself. And then later on is when you remember there is a man of God or there is God uh, that you can run to. But this guy immediately, the thing he said is, Sir, mm -hmm. the version says, Master. Master. Um, it was a borrowed axe. Mm -hmm. And it, in line with uh, just what you, we learned about the anointing at the gathering, mm -hmm. it's just a thing for recognizing the anointing. And when we believe in God, we shall be established. When we believe in, our, in, in God's prophets, we shall be shallacked. We shall be accelerated or prosper. And um, I love that response that could, could, could there be a space where I've lost my axe and what is my first response? Yeah. To be honest, for me, my first response is usually how do I get myself out of this thing? Uh, or I become like the Shuna Maituman where I just shelf the thing. I don't even ask for help. I don't pray about it. But this was a rebuke for what's my first response when yeah. I'm in a space where my faith is numbing out or I've lost my first love or the passion that I used to have. I yeah. love that. Mm. Let, me, let me ask, even mm. as you're asking that, mm. what are some of the things that have made you lose passion? What are some of the things that have made you just lose sight for ministry, for God, for things of faith? I mean, each of us has probably been there. So maybe mm. that's a good even place, even as before yeah. we go into solutions here to just talk. Mm. Have you been, I mean, pastors, you look like you're always <laughs> on the mountain, Kina Pastor James, yeah. 40 days, <laughs> Kina SG, which retreat, when, you know, so in between retreats, do you ever lose your passion for God <laughs> because you're always on the mountain, the yeah. Pastor Mills, with, you know, yeah. it's like, do you guys ever, Pastor Carol, I mean, pa you can't imagine Pastor Carol losing oh, her love Pastor for Carol. God, you know, oh. how, oh, no. where, yeah. who, so I mean, th has that ever happened for you and what was it that caused it mm. happening for you? Yeah. yeah, Pastor Victor, you look like you have an answer. What caused you uh, to lose? Not really that I have an answer, but I've gotten there a couple of times, and I realize that, uh, like everyone of, like everyone else, we are, we are humans. We are first uh, humans, then we are children of God, then we are saved, then we are pastors. So we are all on the same journey. It's I only not tell us. us. Yes. <laughs> so, so for me, I'm like. I'm uh, so keen to hear yours. <laughs> I feel at times uh, people don't trust you as a pastor. They're like. They really, really need to see. I really, really no want, want to see. And uh, it takes a toll on you because you get to do it over and over and over and over and over. And it's so interesting as uh, 
I think about it that way. Today, there, there was someone who attended our meeting and for him, he said, for someone to finally get to a place where he earns your trust, it took him like seven years. Yeah, yeah. And for me, I was like, hey, now this one makes sense. Because for, for him, he felt after seven, years, after seven years is when finally he felt people would really follow him without him feeling the, the, the I am not trusted, I am... It is it it is it it is heavy on me that vibe of it is heavy on me. So yeah, for for me it's that wow. for people to feel so as much as you're their pastor, you're trying, you're trying, but they're so like having eh, people just doubt or yeah. not not trust, and that yeah. wears down on you. It yeah, it wears down. I'm like wow. if you guys only know the sacrifices mm. that I have to go through because I'm I'm just like you. I'm not any ordinary, but I've yeah. decided to do this because of all of us, including myself. Yeah. And if I do it in, including myself, I wouldn't do anything bad for me. And I don't have any bad thoughts wow. for you as well. So having to prove yourself over and over. Yeah. That takes a toll. Yeah. Pastor Carl. I think, yeah, I think for me it happened uh, maybe three years ago or something like that. Yep. When, um, oh my goodness. I, I just, one day I woke up and I couldn't sleep. I had insomnia. And I remember just not sleeping for five nights and then going to hospital and telling them this is what I'm going through. Uh, going to, to one doctor after another and not getting proper solutions mm -hmm. to why it is. Because, you know, for me, I've, I've never had an issue sleeping. Yeah. I could sleep day and night. The issue was waking up. <laughs> the issue was waking up. <laughs> it really was. And so, uh, and so I, I, really felt, I really felt helpless. I really doubted the presence of God. I doubted the love of God. I even doubted if God could heal me. Yeah. And I think it was those things where for a long time, because it happened over maybe two years, um, I think it was one of those ones where at some point it became a no-go zone where I just couldn't even pray about it. Because yeah. like, I got in the middle, I've, I've cried out in desperation so many times in the middle of the night to sleep. I haven't slept. So I even made it a no-go zone. Yeah. So is that that was really so a health. Time. So so I think what I'm hearing you say, and maybe you're speaking for many people here, uh, yeah, is health. sometimes when you have those health situations mm -hmm. where it's really afflicting you, and you feel like you've almost lost God's love. Yeah, it's like God, present. don't you see? Don't you care? Care? I'm praying and praying and doing everything, but nothing is nothing changing. Nothing is changing. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So health, your health can cause you your to to lose your edge. Yeah. yeah, Pastor Mills, what, what's, what's your situation? Well, I, I have many. I'm, I'm trying to pick which, <laughs> which one. one? <laughs> um, so I'm trying to look at which ones I've not shared on this platform. Uh, I think one is uh, where probably you are not recognized or the effort you've put is not recognized. Mm. Uh, I don't know whether to call it affirmation. Um, I remember there is this family uh, that came from southwestern Kenya. I'll try to be general. Um, and uh, they lost a brother, and I found my way to the deep parts of their shags without knowing where I'm going, but asking for directions to bury their bro. Um, a little later, another bro was killed. I traveled, went, buried the bro. Uh, later, uh, when they lost uh, one of their parents, actually I was at the hospital, um, and um, I'm actually the one who closed the eyes of their mom oh, wow. uh, and took her to the morgue. And then later, because of offense, carrying someone else's offense on their behalf, they left the church with many people. Ouch. Yani, I lost the edge for doing visitations for a long time. Yeah. Because you're like, so why do visitations if they will leave? Yeah. Why go to the trouble of doing all these things? And what uh, a you know, they'll just leave you. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, uh, it, it became a very interesting thing to even just feel like ministry is like a thankless job. Mm. Um, yeah. So when, when people do not recognize effort or they forget quickly uh, yeah. the things you've done, uh, offense, pain can just make you uh, be. You, you know, it's interesting you say ministry, but I actually think that's a, the, in fact, the right <laughs> word is leadership. Leadership is a thankless task. Mm -hmm. And many times people lose their edge because of how.
people are quick to criticize leaders, but very slow to affirm leaders. Mm. And so I'm hearing you just talk about the fact that, yeah, when there's that space of just quick to take offense, mm. and yet you feel like you've gone out for the person. Mm. I hope you're hearing your pastors have real issues. <laughs> I think for me, the one that has made me lose my edge in the past has been uh, burnout. And, you know, if you read the story of Elijah before Elisha, there was a guy, prophet called Elijah, who he was serving God. He was in the middle of the mountain. And one day he just couldn't wake up, didn't have any energy, didn't want to fight. He was just finished and just wanted to give up. And I think I've been there. And maybe that's one of the reasons why for me the retreat that we were talking about earlier is so important. Mm -hmm. Because I realized I could even have prayed, fasted. But because I was not refreshing, I was not re re refueling the soul. Because I feel like the, f the, s the fasts you go to do, those are your spirit. You, ref you refuel your spirit. Your spirit can be on fire, but your soul is dead. Mm -hmm. Your emotional capacity is just starved. Mm -hmm. You've not, and so going into a retreat for me is a place where I go and get my affirmation from God. I get my rest for my body, my, sp my soul, and I come back refreshed. And I know there's been once or twice when I just completely got disillusioned and just didn't feel like I wanted to be in ministry. You know, I think there's a, there's a couple of times around the time of COVID when I just felt, ah, I don't think this thing is worth it. And I think I even began to think about what does it look like to retire from ministry. And you know, the thing about such, such things, many times we say, I feel like my season is over. The Holy Spirit hasn't talked to you. You've just, you're just burning out. You know, he hasn't talked to you. You're just not feeling the place anymore. But God hasn't told you to move yet. And I feel for me that what helped was just getting into that space where I could refresh, start listening to God. Because we did talk about the fact that the axe is where you dropped it. And you need to go back do, to doing the things that you are doing mm. in order to receive the same experience you are getting. Mm. But I don't know, uh, Pastor Faith, uh, do you, are there anything? You look so spiritual. It doesn't look like you ever lose your... No, I think my pastor needs to mention part of it. But yeah, offense sometimes is a, can lead to fire burning where you oh. you you process an offense too much that you know you give up and you you, you lose your uh, um cutting edge yeah yeah, yeah. Oh. so offense and it's good that you know yourself you know because i know there are many of us who there's been situations where somebody said something somebody did something it almost made you leave, leave church almost made you leave your faith almost made you not believe again uh, and I suspect many of us have been in that place where you almost just didn't want to go to church anymore because of something somebody said or somebody did. Mm -hmm. And the devil used that to just cause you to lose your edge. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I think one more is um, when you've been praying for something for a while, but then God has not answered, especially how you expected him to answer. Yeah. And so you lose that passion. Um, not, not faith in God, but you lose your passion for prayer. Mm -hmm. I think I've also been there. Yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah. Prayer becomes almost automatic, huh? Yeah. You know, and I have to say, there are times I've been grateful for the 430 prayers because there are times you actually get low in your tank. Yeah. And you're just like, let me just show up for prayer, even me as a pastor, <laughs> just because I need to be there, you know? Yeah. So I feel like, yeah, that losing of the edge, it's a natural thing. It does happen in ministry. Pastor Victor, you're going to add one more uh, for yourself. Yes, yes. Hoping it won't sound controversial. Uh, for me, uh, <laughs> politics is, is something that I, I personally don't like because I feel... At times we, we, we bring it within the team and it, it, it appears as if we are, we are ah, fighting Ah, you mean when there's politics other. in the organization yes, you're working yes, in? Yes, or yes, yeah, you're supposed ministry. to be fighting the, the, the enemy, but, but the battles become in between colleagues. So you find that slows us down from the objective that we should be uh, working towards to now resolving me between me and you. Yeah. And we lose focus on the objective that we should be having. Yeah. So there someone feels... Ah, I wish we could be on the same page rather than fighting and we focus on, on that. That, that. that happens to me as well. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because I think for all of us, regardless of who we are, there are seasons in our lives, whether we, you know, because when you're on the high, you feel like you'll never go down. In the middle of a gathering, yay, anointing, fearless. But all of us get into that space where there are seasons when we lose that something. You lose that it, lose that spark, lose that passion for God. And you can tell I'm dragging myself in. It's like I don't feel like it. It's not like when I'd sign up for a gathering like two months before. Mm. This one I'm even like, do I really want to go? I just don't feel that energy. Do I feel like going to my discipleship group? It doesn't make sense to me right now. You've just lost that thing. And at some point, by the time it, many times by the time you realize it, it's been going on for a while. Mm. 
but it's just you've just been getting more and more blunt, losing that edge. You've just been declining. You didn't mean to lose your edge, but you lost it. Yeah. And and I think that's a, it can be scary when you find yourself in that place because you're like now. I mean, it's like sometimes you can feel like, how do I ever get back? to the place I used to be? How do I get back to loving God? How do I get back to loving people again, loving being in a discipleship group? And maybe who, those, some of you who are listening have been in that place or are in that place right now mm-hmm. where you've just lost the edge. Mm-hmm. You look back and you're like, I'm definitely not where I used to be. Mm-hmm. I don't serve the same way. I don't give the same way. I don't, I'm not as passionate about God as I used to be. Mm-hmm. And maybe it's good for you to be able to reflect and ask, what is it? Because one of the things that you need to be able to do is ask, what happened? Mm-hmm. And we talked about that in the message. You have to acknowledge uh, you have to, first of all, you have to acknowledge that I- this edge was given to you. Yeah. You didn't get it yourself, yeah. uh, which I thought was a very helpful thing because sometimes it's like I'm trying to psych something up. I, I, I never psyched it up in the first place. God gave it to me. Yeah. That passion I had for God, God gave it to me. But then number two, I have to be honest where I lost it. Mm. I have to be willing to acknowledge, you know, it's that conversation I had with Pastor Milton mm. and it just killed, mm. it killed my faith. Mm. It killed my desire. Mm. But see, as we talk, I think there are times when you and I have argued in the past, long time ago, and you've lost your passion for serving. Mm. Just, I think I say that because you and I have been together for so many <laughs> years, <laughs> probably more than anybody else on this team. And I, are falling to the ground. I know, I know there are times when we've talked with Pastor Mills and just had some friction between us, and I could just tell he just lost it. He just didn't want to be serving. But you know, it, the friction comes because we are both human and we are both broken, mm. but the devil takes advantage of the friction. What was natural, what should have been a skirmish and something that we resolved, mm. ends up becoming a deep-seated offense. Mm. And that's how the devil takes, takes advantage of all of us yeah. and gets us to a place where it's like, why am I even doing this? Mm. I'm not even appreciated here. Mm. Yeah. You're going to say, Pasi? Yeah, you've just given me a light bulb to discover <laughs> myself. Because <laughs> I realize now, I think the problem I had when we had those conversations, because I'd lost my edge, I was using my handle to bang trees. So I couldn't cut anything. I couldn't couldn't do the work. I couldn't engage uh, my calling effectively. And because I'm still in the field and all I have is the handle, Mm. uh, I'm swinging away. And it becomes very frustrating. Mm. So you may think it's even just the offense, but it's because now, you are no longer productive. You are no longer effective. Wow. You are no longer meaningful. And when that gets lost, uh, you can even get more angry with someone. Yeah. It happens in relationships. It happens when maybe uh, as spouses, you are not getting along. And then you are seeing someone else is walking with their handle. And they are doing stuff with their handle out there. And you are thinking, oh, you are having your life and me, I'm suffering in my heart. You know, uh, it, can, mm. it can be hard. So f- the fact that you've lost your edge makes you not effective yeah. and then makes you even more sensitive to offense. Exactly. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah go ahead. Mine, uh, as I think about it now, I, I, in fact, I had not um, put two and two together, but wha- even when I talk about the insomnia and the issues that I went through, um, prior to entering into now that whole two-year journey, I had just done a 40-day fast. Mm. asking God for the key to healing. I didn't know what I was praying. (laughs) I didn't know, but I think I was asking for an anointing for healing. But it wasn't for me to lay hands. I I hadn't thought about it that way. But honestly, all the ways that I have learned how to pray have come in the middle of the night, or or rather in the night when I'm awake trying to sleep. And... Asking God. So so anyway, so I think the thing that turned it around for me was when I started saying, God, God, I must be going through this season for a reason. So show me. And as he showed me, that's the way, you know, that whole thing of praying uh, and uh, deliverance prayers, all those things. That's how that came about. So the key to healing, that anointing I was asking for came through via insomnia so yeah. uh, but anyway yeah but uh, i think for me but the time that moment oh it was crazy you were dying wow. i was dying i was dying actually i remember and, you, and s- you were you, you were you i was were looking at you i'm like you've lost your you're you're not praying anymore yeah. what's happening yeah i couldn't pray yeah yeah, yeah. it was yeah. really crazy wow. so but anyway god was working something mm. I, I and until i asked him i was going to remain in that 
a very deep place of, of despair uh, and of losing it. If I hadn't asked God, God, what do you want me to learn from this? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You know, the crazy thing is many of us have been there, but it's easy for us if we're not honest with why we fell there mm -hmm. and note that for the devil to keep using it. Yeah. And so there's some of us where you were offended last year, you lost your edge, you came back, got offended again, mm -hmm. and you've not begun to understand, you know, this is actually a vulnerability. Mm -hmm. That for me, the devil uses people's words mm -hmm. to cause me to get, mm -hmm. to lose my edge. Eh? Mm -hmm. And what ends up happening is I get annoyed at the pastor and I stop serving. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm punishing the pastor, but actually the devil is just laughing all the way. Mm -hmm. And so just being able to understand what is it that causes me? Is it I fall ill? Mm -hmm. Or is it, I, you know, there's a pattern. And I feel like what happens is if you don't understand the patterns that he uses to attack you, you will be vulnerable every time. Let's use this even in marriage. Many times what happens in our marriage is they're triggers. Yeah. And the devil just knows how to use your spouse to say the right thing at the wrong time. Mm. Or the wrong thing at the right yeah. time, you know, whichever one it is. But it's like there's a trigger. And just when you're psyched about your marriage, something is said. And mm. boom, you blow up. Mm. And you've not understood, actually, this is just the way the devil has just removed the edge in our marriage mm -hmm. because I believe what we're talking about right now applies in marriage it applies in ministry as well mm -hmm. so how do you begin to understand and become honest about this is where I lost my edge mm -hmm. I lost my edge because I'm easily offended mm -hmm. I lost my edge because I have issues in my past that I keep bringing into this marriage mm -hmm. I lost my edge because I am afraid God doesn't really care about me mm -hmm. and I'm not sure that he really does care about me I lost my edge because I don't trust God and whenever I feel like he's not holding me, I have to hold myself up. Mm -hmm. So what is it that has caused me to lose my edge or causes me to lose my edge? Mm -hmm. And then now that I'm aware, how do I begin to take back what I've lost? Wow. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't know. I mean, for me, that's, that's kind of what I'm hearing where we're leading with this mm -hmm. is let's be honest with ourselves. Huh? Mm -hmm. I mean, that person who just every DG, every other DG, they've, they're not coming back. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, it's, there's always something that just makes you lose your edge. Uh, you just, you blow your top whenever somebody says something. And it's like, ah, and you disappear again. Mm. And it's like, there's just this pattern the enemy is just using. He's pressing those buttons mm. to keep pushing you back. Yeah. Uh, I think for me, uh, when it comes to marriage, I remember we would have, we would not see eye to eye. And my goodness, that was enough for you and us, who? Tom. Me and you. Oh. <laughs> uh, hey. like, huh? It could happen us? to you. <laughs> <laughs> it was a I'm storm. Just kidding. <laughs> so I would pout, I would do silent treatment, hoping that that would work, it would not work. I'd get frustrated that you're not noticing that you know things are not working. Uh, and, and I think I noticed that that was my, my pattern. You know, we'd get into a disagreement and then I would go into this downward spiral. Um, yeah, so if you're talking about uh, noticing a catching pattern, yourself. catching yourself, I just noticed. Yeah, so, I what happened when you caught that? What did you do now? What now that you knew what it was, yeah. how did that help? Uh, I think uh, what helped was uh, uh, I, I don't know, it was just God really showing me the pattern and then showing me that um, it's a work of the enemy. Yeah, it's showing me, you know, you normally say the enemy can come and punch. Uh, punch you and then hide behind your spouse mm. and then you th all you can see is your spouse. Mm. Yep. So God began to show me, hey, Anyewe, you have an enemy and it is not your husband. Yeah. Mm. You do have an enemy. And so I actually started um, binding. <laughs> you know, I, I just started praying and uh, the feeling would go, the angst would go, the pain would go, the anger would go. Especially once I recognized that these were darts, these were arrows, these these were schemes of the enemy. Once I I realized that, then you know the whole thing changed. Yeah. And I stopped, I stopped taking offense. You know, once I recognized that I, I actually do have an enemy. enemy. You're you're helping my neighbor. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, and you're right. I mean, sometimes we're just we're just in patterns in our marriage, and it's mm -hmm. like you're thinking that you know if I just punish you enough. By just keeping quiet or by pouting or by, you know? Sleeping at the edge of the bed, Sleep almost falling, <laughs> you know, those kinds giving of things. An elbow. Giving an elbow, <laughs> push, <laughs> making sure the elbow is poking so someone <laughs> put it here. <laughs> Are these confessions, pastors? I'm not sure. <laughs> this is, <laughs> or you're talking about what your neighbors do. So, so, guys, you have to be honest about it because if you're not honest, you can't take it back. Yeah. And as long as you're blaming, as long as you're shifting yeah. blame, yeah. you're saying it's the other person's responsibility to keep your edge sharp, 
it's the pastor who made me lose it. It's my wife who made me lose my edge. It's my disease that made me lose my edge. It's my mother's not being healed that made me lose my edge. As long as you're shifting the blame on something else, you can't really receive your healing. Yeah, and, and Pasi, um, I was even sharing with the congregation on Sunday, you end up being the one who's on the losing side. Because the edge is what makes you productive and effective, isn't it? Yeah. So it is your technology towards being fruitful, being able to multiply, being able to increase, being able to subdue your challenges, and working in authority. Yeah. That's it. So what is the enemy doing when he makes you lose the edge? You lose these blessings of God yeah. and your ability yeah. to actually become productive. So for me, I just discovered last year that at the end of the day, I am either productive or unproductive. Yeah. And if I choose to carry offense, I'm unproductive. Wow. If I choose to look at my trauma, I am unproductive. Wow. If I choose to look at the affirmation that I did not receive, mm -hmm. I am unproductive. <laughs> and I asked myself, do I want to be productive? Then, guy, just adult yourself and <laughs> stop doing childish things. Um, it's just like the way people could do even in marriage, kneel by mouth. Mm. By the way, you keep kneel by mouth a day, two, three, four, five, t six days later, you're talking to the same person. Mm. You've wasted six days your with life. your kneel by mouth yeah. and making your mouth smell. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. But, but you know, I, man of God, you're getting personal, as somebody said, <laughs> because I think that's how we operate. It's a, and what you're talking about is maturity. You're really t when you, you said adulting, it's like grow up, mm. you know? When you try to punish your pastor, when you try to punish your spouse, when you try to punish the other person by withdrawing, yeah. your boss, try to punish God by not going to serve. Yeah. It's you who suffers. Mm -hmm. And that's just immaturity. Mm -hmm. So how do we begin to take back what we lost? And I think that's what this message took us into. Mm -hmm. Because for this person, uh, it was interesting. Elijah didn't say, axe head float. Mm -hmm. And the thing floated. Uh, he did something, but then he told the guy, pick it up. Mm. He helped him see it, and the thing floated. The miracle was there. Mm. But you know, Elijah could have just said, boom, and the axe thing just fell together and became tight. Mm. But this guy helped. He, he, he did something, the thing floated, but this guy's job, it, he still had a job to pick it up, put it back on the axe head, Probably tighten it. Mm. Yeah, get in the water, get wet. Mm. There was a process there. Yeah. And it's almost like God is saying, I need you to, take a to play a part in the miracle that I want to do in your life. Mm. There's a role you have to play. Wow. I'm not going to heal your marriage with you sitting like this, wow. waiting for me to change your wife. It's not going to happen. You know, I'm not going to give you faith by you sitting in the house. Yeah. There's something you're going to have to do. Wow. And I think that's what, what the, the tagline was. If you want what you once had, you've got to do what you once did. Yeah. If you want, and I think this is something we teach in marriage. If you want the feelings to come in your marriage, you have to start acting like you love the person. Mm. What does that mean? It means I start telling you I love you, even if I'm not feeling it. I'm not mm. pretending. What Love? Huh? Was I pretending? Yeah. No, I wasn't. Were oh, you pretending last night? No. <laughs> 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 this wife of mine, she's going to kill me here. Man of God. Man of God. It's Gary personal, <laughs> woman of God. <laughs> no, it's not that. I think it's, it's not pretending to actually be able to say, I love you objectively. Mm. Because I love you. Whether I feel like it or not, I love you. Mm. Love is not about feeling. Mm. It's choosing to act in a loving way. It's choosing to say, I will serve you. Mm. I will do the things you know, I know you enjoy. If I know you enjoy a massage, I will give you a massage. If I know you enjoy me meeting you at the door and making, making sure there's food and everything, I will do those things for you. Because that's what a loving spouse does. Mm. And I'm going to trust God to bring the feelings. Mm. Because if I'm sitting there waiting miraculously for feelings, I'm pray for my marriage. My marriage is horrible. I don't understand my, my man. I mean, nothing will ever change. Mm. And God is like saying, you're a participant in your healing. Mm. You're a participant in your deliverer. Wow. So if it's like, I, I don't feel like I really have psych for God, it's like, yeah, get back into that 4.30 prayer meeting. Do the things that you once did. Do them not because you feel like doing them. Do them by faith. Mm. And trust God to bring the feelings afterwards. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, I think if I go back to the insomnia story, the thing that turned it around, I realized I wasn't... Uh, before that, I used to listen to worship music. I used to worship. I used to read God's word. But because of insomnia, maybe I'll just say, oh, I'm so tired in the morning. I'm not. It's so hard to pull yourself. I just want it so hard to pull myself to even listen to worship music or read God's word. 
Yet, I think somewhere in it all, I decided, okay, let me just start listening, even if it was the hardest thing that I found to do, uh, listening to worship music, worshiping again, and even listening to the Bible. Mm. Just listening, listening to the Bible, just listening, uh, deciding, okay, let me just start from Matthew and I'll just listen. I think that's what uh, turned it around for me, but it was difficult. And I believe when, when you are in that place where you've lost your edge, I, mean, I think you're facing oppression. You're really uh, facing oppression from the enemy yep. who's making it so difficult for you to even go back to those rhythms, go back to... It, it, it just takes a lot of energy, but you have to. You have to understand in your head, I'm fighting an enemy, and I definitely just need to do these things, no matter how, how much you have to psych yourself. Wow. wow. That's so powerful. My goodness, that's really a good, a good place to... Because to, to, I think you're so right. I mean, that's, that's exactly... I think you've placed it so well. That's exact. And you know, somebody said, and I think it was Pastor Kilons, you said, Jesus took the cross so you can get the boldness. You know, Elijah threw in a stick. But he said, Jesus took the cross and he presented that stick for you. And it's almost like it's time for you to pick up your edge again. Uh, Elijah threw a stick and told the guy, pick up your axe. And Jesus took up the cross and then he said, you pick up your edge again. It's there. Where you dropped it, it's there. Your passion for God is still there. You just have to pick it up and participate in your healing. Your passion for your marriage is still there. There's something you have to do. You have to participate. Uh, the funny thing is in the, in, the, in the Bible, God never worked in a vacuum. Mm. He always said, what do you have in your hands? Mm. And then he multiplied it and made it enough. Mm. I've always marveled at Jesus and the way he did that and the way God does that, mm. that somehow he chose never to work independently of a human's action. Mm. There was always a step of faith required mm. for God then to do his, his miracles. Mm. And God may just be waiting on you to say, come on, begin to do those things. Start to act like you love me even though you're not feeling me right now. Start to act like you love ministry, even though right now that's not what you're feeling like doing. Start to act like you love your spouse, your children. You know, whatever it is, that place you're feeling that you've lost your edge, start to do what you did in the past. And then watch me take it and multiply it and make it enough. I really sense that's God wo God's word for us. Yeah. Plus yeah. Faith. So I think for me, I found out that is that has been a secret I've realized in my Christian life where you do something fast. God, God told the Israelites, step your foot fast in the water, yep. and the water would part. Um, the guy who was lying at the mat, Jesus said, take up your mat, then walk. So God, so I'm the type of person who sometimes wants God to do everything. Mm. Uh, you've been given the gift of healing somehow, some, you know, it's supposed to work without you laying hands on someone. Yep. You've been given the gift of prophecy. Somehow, you know, you don't want to do the, the first act. Mm. So it could be for prophecy, you just open up your mouth and just start speaking, and then God uses you in that way. So the sec that, that I, th I believe that line is a secret to even our, our life of faith, yeah. where you step out in faith, you do what God is asking you, and then you see the results. Wow. wow. Probably if, if I can quickly add something to what Pastor Faith has said. For you to receive something, you have to get to the place of admiration, because you can't receive from anything that you don't admire from. So the the yes yes the guy lost the axe uh, the axe head but there was a place where he identified this is where he lost it, and he was told go. So he he realized it was not his. He he admired to have it back because of how precious it was. As a place of realizing, uh, this is where I lost it and I have to go with 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 this guy who I I love and I trust in so that I may go and have it back. So there's there's a process for you to get to the restoration of whatever it is you want to have back if you've lost it. Well, that's a good, and uh, maybe you're tying us back as we conclude then to our, our gathering. Mm. Because you talked about the fact that there's anointing that God has given yeah. your leaders yeah. for your benefit. Mm. Yeah. And in this case, having Elisha in, in the house was not a coincidence. Mm. Yeah. They invited him along. They could have done it without him, but they invited mm. him along. And because he was there, mm. this guy was able to say, hey, I've lost something really precious. Mm. And somehow God had already given Elisha a word and a miracle for him. Mm. And one of the things we were learning is many times God uses, he works through humans. It's just a very humbling thing. Mm. I'm always, I look in the scripture and I'm like, I don't blame the people who got offended because they had to work through a human being. You know, Naaman comes, he's a Syrian general, he commands armies, mm. and then he has to humble himself and go to prophet Elisha mm. and say, I need healing. Mm. And then Elisha says, go and do this. And it's like, why? I mean, just speak the words. 
But that's not the way God works. And I feel like maybe even today, as we're getting into our discipleship groups, maybe one of the places God is going to heal you through is you confessing to your group, the people that God has put around you, hey guys, I've l- we're losing our edge. I feel like we've lost the edge in our marriage. I feel like I've lost the edge in my, uh, in my faith in God. I feel like I've lost my edge in ministry. I feel like I've lost my, whatever, e- whatever edge you've lost, being able to confess it openly to your group and then even asking, pray for me. And to challenge your DG leaders, hey, pray for the people that God has given you because perhaps God has given you an anointing mm-hmm. that is going to break the yoke in someone's life. Mm-hmm. So I think I, I, I love the fact that you've kind of, Pastor Victor, you've kind of brought the loop and closed it for us. And it's just to say, guys, as we get into prayer, I want us to just talk about number one, maybe share, at, an op- share when you lost your edge and what caused that. Mm-hmm. So make sure everybody has a chance to just share that. And then just begin to talk about, you know, um, what are things you need to start doing now? Because <laughs> we talked about do the things you did. Mm-hmm. What are some things that you feel you're being challenged to do that are things that would, you would do if you really had the edge mm-hmm. and that you can trust God then to make it enough? Mm-hmm. And then get the group to pray for you. So let's, let's, uh, my prayer is, by the way, uh, you know this year, what's our theme? Uh, we, it's unshakable, isn't oh. it? I sense that every message God has brought to us this year is a message to make us unshakable. Oh. And we're talking about the things that make us shakable. But today we're learning some major secrets in ministry. I love what Pastor Faith called them. She says it's a secret. I've learned this secret, you know. I need to actually trust God to make it enough. I have to take the step and then trust God to make it enough. So let's get into that space as we're praying in our DGs. Let's pray for one another and let's strengthen one another in this time. This is why we're family. None of us was ever meant to be great alone. Uh, We take this journey together and we ensure that no person is left behind. We succeed together. Amen. So I want us just uh, to pray as we conclude our time. Uh, Father, I thank you so much for the people of Mavuno Church. Thank you for this conversation, Lord. It's been a real conversation, and Lord, we've been able to share. Thank you for every one of these pastors uh, in the room and uh, the places where we have in the past felt we lost our edge. Uh, because of things others did or things we did, mistakes we made, patterns that the enemy used to afflict us. Thank you that, Lord, you've given us self-awareness, and you're giving us even more self-awareness about how we can strengthen ourselves in the Lord. But Lord, I want to pray for every one of us that as we have these conversations as a discipleship group, Lord, give us such love for one another. Give us such an ability to be vulnerable and open with each other that none of us would ever be taken off advantage of by the enemy through being isolated. Thank you for this community of, 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 of people who love each other, for, of believers. And I pray that, Lord Jesus, you're going to help every one of us regain our edge and live permanently with a sharp edge. Uh, to glorify you and to carry out the assignment that you have given us. Father, we pray for anointing upon your people. Uh, We pray that, Lord, this anointing would break the yoke. And I pray that, Lord, even as we pray for each other, that indeed we will see miracles in response to those prayers. We love you, God's people. We love you, Lord, for giving us an amazing family to be part of. And we speak a blessing over you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And God's people say it together. Amen. 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 God bless you. Have a wonderful evening. See you at family night next week. Amen. The theme of this gathering is cash the anointing. In your life, you need desperately to be able to achieve the thing that God is calling you to do. All these excuses come out of fear. I believe anointing is the power of the Holy Spirit in your life to enable you to carry out